The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in trusting Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living hell will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love that lasts forever know His hope and sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome again to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, we continue to study the various types and shadows of the Bible. As was stated in an earlier episode, when we study all of Scripture, we tend to see that indeed God seems to create all things according to a pattern which testifies of Him. As we continue to look and study the visible and invisible things of creation, we are able to increasingly see God's reflection to some degree in that mirror. When these examples occur within Scripture, we characteristically refer to them as types or shadows. We shall also see that ultimately, as with all Scripture, that these types and shadows point to the substance, which is Jesus. In this episode, we turn our attention to the story of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, as we shall see, is ground zero for any proper understanding of Scripture. Let's pray. Father, We pray that as we begin this study, you would prepare the soil of our spirit through your mercy and grace to give us understanding of the substance for which these types and shadows serve. We further pray that having planted the seeds of understanding that your power, grace, and love would be present to water, to grow, and bring forth fruit in our lives to your glory and honor, now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the message and meaning of this story is both simple and complex. It is at once outwardly apparent and yet profoundly enigmatic. A casual reading of the incident may result in viewing the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as being analogous to the fairy tale poison apple in Snow White. As such, it is easy to incorrectly attribute supernatural or magical properties given the fruit of the tree. What then is the story of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden about? When we read the Bible for the first time, we are surprised, perhaps disappointed, to discover Adam and Eve eat the fruit in disobedience and are cast out of the garden as a result. When we finish the Old Testament and reach the event of the crucifixion, 
we may hopefully realize that the stage of Jesus' suffering, crucifixion, death, and burial was set thousands of years earlier during this garden episode. We may excuse or fix blame with Adam and Eve for their decision to eat the fruit, but what of God? Why did God place the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, knowing that the results would be what they were if Adam and Eve ate? Was it not possible to create a garden without this tree? Why couldn't God place the tree behind locked gates to which only he had the key? Before we can understand why God placed the tree in the garden, we need to clearly understand what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil really is. Let me direct your attention to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, which say, quote, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them." Unquote. The above verses tell us that when God first created man, he created Adam and Eve as his image bearers. These same verses use the plural terms us and our to reveal God's triune nature. The question then must be asked, did God's original created image of Adam and Eve include those same aspects of his triune nature? While we do not know specifically what Adam and Eve looked like in their original pre-fall condition, early rabbinic writings recount that Adam and Eve had what was referred to as clothing similar to an opal-like fingernail covering of light. Whether this was a pre-fall version of a glorified body or something else is not clear. What is clear is that at the moment Adam and Eve sinned, their eyes were opened and at that moment they saw themselves as being naked. Thus, whatever the original covering was, it was now gone as a result of Adam and Eve's decision. To a great extent, the answer to the riddle of what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents lies within the question of just how much of God's image was fully and accurately endowed unto Adam and Eve. To begin with, the Hebrew word teslim, meaning image, literally means, quote, to shade, unquote, a semblance, a shadow, likeness, or resemblance. Thus, the idea and the reality is that like a photograph, Adam and Eve had enough of God's image qualities visible to be able to recognize God as being their original master cast and creator. At the same time, there were features and or attributes missing from the image which distinguished the original creator from his creation. The question is, what distinguishing features and or qualities were Adam and Eve lacking from God's image? Unfortunately, much as it is tempting to speculate what possible characteristics Adam and Eve may or may not have held in their pre-fall condition, we are forced to limit ourselves to deducing those things which are logically evident from Scripture. Firstly, in general, we know Adam and Eve had the ability in their pre-fall condition to exercise true free will. God set before them both a choice to obey him. Both Adam and Eve had the choice to either obey or disobey God's command not to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. We must conclude, therefore, that God created them both with the nature and ability to make either choice equally successfully. Stated another way, Adam and Eve had the present ability and nature to choose evil or to choose good. God's nature, however, is very different from that of Adam and Eve, whereas God has the ultimate power and ability to do anything he wants, his own nature constrains him to do only and always what is perfectly good. Second, Adam and Eve were both finite in their knowledge and understanding. If Adam and Eve already possessed the knowledge of good and evil, 
there would have been no point of this serpent tempting either of them with knowledge they already possessed. God, on the other hand, who is infinite, already possessed all knowledge and can never be said to be learning or lacking anything. Third, Adam and Eve had a spiritual and physical status which was different from that of God. God told Adam and Eve that if they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die in that day. But what is meant? Does it mean that they will continue to live eternally, physically, and never die? Does it mean their spirits will live eternally and never die in whatever state, or both? Clearly, again, God is different. God is perfect and immutable. His glory and nature remains consistent and intact from all eternity. There never was and never will be any chance of losing or lessening it. By contrast, Adam and Eve were created perfect, but mutable. This means that Adam and Eve were perfect when they were created, but unlike God, they had the permissive potential to change. The glory which Adam and Eve, which God shared with them, was conditioned upon their obedience and faith. Another way to think of this is to remember that God is perfectly holy, just, and merciful. God is omniscient, omnipowerful, and omnipresent. God declares in numerous passages a central and key cornerstone of this truth. For example, Exodus chapter 15, 11, quote, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Unquote. First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 20, quote, O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you. Unquote. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, quote, Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. Unquote. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5, quote, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Unquote. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21, quote, Is it not I, Yahweh, and there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior? There is none except me, unquote. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, quote, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, unquote. These verses, and indeed the entirety of Scripture, declare that although God is triune, He is singular in the sense of being God. There was no God before Him, and there is none beside Him, and there is none who can replace Him. This being the case, whenever God creates, whatever He creates is never greater than or equal to His full and complete nature in all its aspects. Instead, whatever God creates is perfect and good, but is by necessity limited in one or more aspects to being subordinate and inferior to God. Second, the consequence of Adam and Eve's disobedience carried the punishment of death. Thus, life and death was also conditional. Adam and Eve had the potential to maintain their status in the Garden of Eden in fellowship with God for eternity. Conversely, they could also make a decision which would lead to death. Whether we infer the death to be spiritual, physical, or both, the distinction is that God is alive, eternal, and never dies. Adam and Eve's ultimate decision changed them conditionally and caused God to move them from the garden lest they should eat the tree of life and live forever. God, by distinction, never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is all-powerful and is by the same power God, by his own mercy, volunteered to exit eternity, enter earth and tabernacle in human flesh as a servant, where he, in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, might suffer death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. By definition, Adam and Eve could and did choose death. Once the choice was made, they had no power on their own, unlike God, to rise again and conquer death, whereas God has ever present the power over life and death. God himself declared all of his creation, including Adam and Eve, as being not simply good, 
but quote-unquote very good. As we ponder the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it must immediately be recognized that the promised knowledge of good is the same Hebrew word for good in both instances. The question arises then, if we assume God is being accurate when he pronounces Adam and Eve as being good, what is to be gained by Adam and Eve possessing knowledge about a characteristic which they have by definition successfully been bestowed? Likewise, with the rest of creation, since all that God created was declared good by God, it seems pointless to have knowledge which would only lead to information which is already established. As for evil, since both Adam and Eve lived in paradise, and all that they beheld was perfectly good, it may have been difficult for them to conceive or understand evil and its implications as it is manifestly a post-fall reality. As such, Adam and Eve only had half the equation. They knew only good, only perfection. Admittedly, possessing the knowledge of evil does not immediately sound like a prize many are going to volunteer for with zeal, but there was a third aspect proposed in conjunction by the serpent. First, the serpent placed doubt in the mind of Eve, though God made it clear by saying, quote, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest, thereof thou shalt surely die. Unquote. The serpent said, quote, Ye shall not surely die. Unquote. There was an immediate contradiction and conflict about the truth. Either God lied or exaggerated, or he is to be trusted implicitly. Secondly, the serpent attributed ulterior motives to God's command, and at the same time, appealed to Adam and Eve's pride as well as their basic desire to please God. Notice how crafty and insidious the temptation is. The serpent avoids overt language regarding disobedience to God and wraps the temptation in candy coating, saying, quote, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, unquote. At its essence, the suggestion is that both Adam and Eve can go beyond being a mere image-bearer and be literally Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for the triune God. At this point, the carrot of knowing good and evil fades into the background as the prospect of the creation, i.e. Adam and Eve, like every child wanting to be equal to, or good as, in all aspects, as their creator, father and mother, looms seemingly under their noses. Without ever being stated, Satan went to the heart of things and said, Follow me. Join me. Satan was created by God as the crowning angel of beauty. He knew full well that he was created by God, and he knew the perfection of God's throne room. Yet, despite all this, he was lifted up with pride and thought within himself that he could be just like or equal to God. Because of this pride, God cast Satan out of the heavenly host. Here in the Garden of Eden, Satan now finds Adam and Eve and appeals to the same pride to become just like God. Satan already knew full well that such prideful aspirations cause separation as opposed to any imagined intentions, innocent or otherwise, of becoming equal to God. Given the outcome with which most are familiar, some would argue that God is unfair and unjust or that Scripture makes no logical sense to consider that a good God would prohibit and punish anyone for the pursuit of such a wonderful endeavor as obtaining knowledge. One can even now hear the veritable emotional hand-wringing, cringing, and anguish at the prospect of living in a world absent the freedom for everyone to knowledgeably discern between good and evil. In fact, the humanistic mind begins with the assumption knowledge, whether it be good and or evil or otherwise, is the highest virtue possible which gives us all purpose and meaning. Therefore, to suggest that any knowledge should be withheld, no matter what the motives or however well-intentioned, is far worse than any evil which that said knowledge leads to. 
However, when discussing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is crucial to fully understand that knowledge does not equate to power to perform. It is possible, in fact, to know everything there is to know about both good and evil, yet with that knowledge intact, there is no implication that any amount of knowledge, no matter how vast, will lead to the actual ability to perform the good and avoid the evil. In order to perform the good and avoid the evil which we have knowledge of would further require power. This is precisely the dilemma which Paul the Apostle discusses and laments in his epistle to the Romans. As you read, remember to try equating the terms law and commandment with the knowledge of good and evil. Imagine placing Paul in the Garden of Eden, and he is making the following argument after eating the fruit and having obtained the knowledge of good and evil promised. Romans chapter 7, verse 7, reads as follows, quote, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment,